Yeah, what I wanted, what I was wanting to do, and uh, and now that I've started messing with this, I really need to take the time to translate more because as I was looking at the translation, a lot of the translation is inaccurate, and and it bothers me. This is, you know, recently I, I I did a message just kind of going back to it again, just for the sake of people that did not know about it. This was uh, dealing with uh, uh, Daniel 11, more specifically in verse 40, the time of the end of the, the, the well, let me get this move out of the way. The king of the south will push at him. And it doesn't say push at him. It actually says push with him, emo. And if you, I'll show you that exactly too, because there's another usage of that up here. Where was it at? Let me see. I saw it a minute ago. Yeah, here we go right here. In verse 11, the king of the south shall be moved with color and shall come forth and fight. Notice this here and fight with him even with the king of the north, right? You see that in blue? And we're going to change the color of that, just for the sake, put it back in blue again. All right, just like I told you before, it's with him. The with him right there, dark blue, right? That's this word right here. That's with him. And then it says, even with the king of the north. Now, it doesn't go into all the words with even, but it does say with Right there again. This is the word with without the vav at the end, like in the one here in the yellow. That's just the word with. With King Hatsiphon, or actually it's the hidden king, is literally what it means. It doesn't mean north, it means hidden king. All right. But the reason why it's important to know this, the with him, and know that it's translated here the correct way, is why then down here in verse. 40, when they have over here, Emo again, Melaka Nagiv, with him, the king of the Nagiv. But over here it says, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south, they, they, they flip it and they put push at him. Now they're translating it at him. It doesn't mean at him. It doesn't mean that at all. So it's an incorrect translation right there. And that's what changes the entire meaning of everything that you're reading here. And the king of the north shall come against him. You can translate this right here as against, but normally it would be over him or upon him. Al is uh, upon or over. Uh, that's what that word means, over the king of the north. All right. So I, I picture this. I see it like a picture that the king of the the north is coming over the land of Israel to attack the Middle East. I wanted to go in this tonight because we've got a lot of things happening in the Middle East right now. There's a threat of war, a threat of our, uh, Iran, uh, Iran claiming they're going to strike Israel. I, I have a hard time believing it unless they're really pushed back into a corner, but we'll see. You never know. But then in the process, I've always... I've never really touched much of Daniel 11 outside of that there, but this caught my attention. I decided I wanted to go more into this tonight, but the only problem was I didn't get enough time to study. I've been studying for several days for tonight, but I couldn't figure out what I wanted to talk about. And so I was bouncing around all different kinds of places. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll go back to Daniel and as I began to read it, verse 6 caught my attention in a way that, and it's something I've actually wondered about before, but I've never, I never thought about it. And uh, so, and I haven't looked at the Hebrew yet, really, to, to know where I'm going to go with on this yet. But anyway, and the king of the south shall be strong, uh, the, the uh, Hikik Melakanigif. Uh, let's see, Umin Shirav, and one of his princes, the word strong is right there. It actually flips backwards when it does it that way. All right, so the king of the Negev, 
and and from his princes or from one of his princes uh he shall be strong above him all right and and uh, and have dominion his dominion shall be great a great dominion all right i just want to see if there's anything i'd catch or i didn't really pay attention much there in the end of years they shall join themselves together and the daughter of the king of the south this is where it gets interesting udbat melech hanagiv to bo el melech hatsifon all right, that means the daughter, this literally means, and the daughter, and excuse me, yeah, and the daughter, let me, I'll break it down for you. There's the word daughter. This is for those of you that want to kind of understand how Hebrew looks and what it, what the words, how they pronounce them. That's bet tav. Bat, like a bat, like a baseball bat, bat, uh, means daughter. And then that little letter in front of it means and. It's a conjunction in there. And the daughter, melech, which is king or messenger. Uh, it can also be angel. Uh, Hanagiv is the Negev desert. Hang on, somebody's trying to jump in. Let's see if I can get them in here. There we go. So the daughter of the king of the Negev, Tabo, the word Bo means to come. The Tav in front of it is a feminine way of saying that she will come. She is going to come to the king of the or the hidden king, Hatsifon, or king of the north. Now, here's where it gets interesting. To make an agreement. But, in English it says, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm. Does anybody even realize what he's talking about? If it's the daughter coming from the Nagiv or from Israel, so to speak. But she doesn't retain the strength of her arm. That sounds like to me that it's speaking of the Christians that have lost the strength of Christ. And they actually come to the king of the north. If I am correct. And that's a big if. I don't know if I'm right on this or not. But that could imply that the king of the north is going to be a president of the United States. Possibly. I mean, you can go back in historical side of this and they'll tell you all kinds of ways that these things get fulfilled. But as I'm looking at it, though, I'm looking at it a little bit differently, especially when I see they don't translate half of this stuff correct in the first place. After, let's see, after it says the king of the north, let's see, to make an agreement. Yeah, that, the asot, that's what. Aso is, it's feminizing it for a woman, though, uh, that she's going to make an agreement. Uh, and says, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begot her, and he that obtained her in those times. I really, it's really strange to say this, but it almost seems like it's the church. Because Israel and technicality actually birthed the 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 modern day or the Gentile church over time, and it almost appears that when it says that you know the king of the south or this way uh, Israel that his daughter goes to the king of the north but does not retain the strength of her arm. The arm would be Christ would be the arm. He would be the one where she should have had that strength from, but she doesn't retain it because she's rejected the Holy Spirit. And he that obtained her in those times. But one of the shoots of her roots shall stand up in his place. Now that's an interesting point. But one of the shoots of her roots 
ועומד, מצד אני שורש שיעה, קנו ורבו, אוקיי, 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 I'll do some work on that on how that's translated the right way, but shall stand up in his place. The question is, is who's his? Be there it is right there. That's where it speaks about when it says his place. And shall come unto the army and shall enter into the stronghold of the king of the north and shall deal with them and shall prevail. So someone that would be almost like but one of the shoots of her roots, so it would actually have to be someone from, Christ, from the Christian circles, will stand up in his place. The part that throws me off, though, is the his. Because it's her roots, but not his place. Whose place? So it really makes you do some scratching your head here. Also, their gods with their molten images and with their precious vessels of silver and gold shall he bring into captivity into Egypt and he shall desist some years from the king of the north and he shall come into the kingdom of the king of the south, but he shall return into his own land. You get into a whole bunch of other things. That's why I said it takes a lot of time for me to really sit down and break this down, what all this is going into. But it all it almost seems like, I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you something else. If you, if you think about this part right here, right? Think it, If I am correct, let's say that this is, but she shall not retain the strength of her arm. Let's say this represents the church without the Holy Spirit, comes into power, she is, according to what according to what this says, the daughter of the king of the south. So that could possibly be the church. Now I say that, and I'll show you something that makes you wonder about this as well. You go to Isaiah. And again, we're looking at prophecies that are dealing with everything that's happening now. The burden of Damascus, and behold, the Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks, but shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. Ephraim has always represented the house of Israel. And if the fortress ceases from Ephraim, in other words, there's no protection and if you remember, this is where Jesus, when he went over into across the Galilee to the far eastern side of that, he actually entered into Syria. And all those that came and wanted to touch the hem of his garment, they, it says they all believed on him. This is why we ended up having such a large church in Damascus, in Syria. And by the word Aram is the word for Syria. And the remnant of Aram shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And it shall come to pass in that day that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean, and it shall be as when the harvestman gather the standing corn and reap at the ears of his arm. Yea, it shall be as when one gleaneth ears in the valley of Rathim. Sorry about all these dogs. That there shall be left therein gleanings as the beating of the olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bird. Let's go down. Let's get down here to verse 9. In that day shall his strong cities be as forsaken places which are forsaken from the children of Israel after the manner of woods of lofty forest, and it shall be a desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation, 
right? Let me back up here real quick. We know that Damascus, it becomes a ruinous heap, right? And that's never been fulfilled. Damascus has been a standing city of some sort since biblical times, oldest city on the planet. But when you come down here and you get to verse 9 and 10, verse 10 specifically, for you have forgotten the God of your salvation. See, so you watch it. In the day shall his strong cities be as the forsaken places which were forsaken from before the children of Israel, after the manner of woods and lofty forests, and it shall be a desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. Therefore you did plant plants of pleasantness and did set, up, set it up with slips of a stranger. And that day of thy planting, you did make it grow. In the morning, you did make thy seed to blossom, a heap of bows in a day of grief and desperate pain. Now, I feel like that that is speaking of those that caused the downfall of Damascus. They forgot the God of their salvation. And you go back to Daniel. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm. If her arm is indeed that of Christ, then we would have right over here, you have forgotten the God of your salvation. Now that could be Israel in that case there, because the next one, and that has not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. That definitely is, is the believers, because Jesus Christ we know is the rock. And you did plant plants of pleasantness and did set it up with slips of a stranger. That verbiage in Hebrew over here is dealing more with when it talks about the planting, the plants of pleasantness and the slips of a stranger. That's like prostitution. That's like, um, oh, how would you say it? Another way to put it would be. In other words, they 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 snuck in evil people to overthrow that nation. Uh, and that's that's what they did. They they basically corrupted the people that were there to turn against their own government. And this is the reason why we see here that the burden of Damascus is taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. Because what? The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus. You remember when Paul was going down to... Um, to, to smite Damascus. We know that he's on his road to Damascus and the Lord Jesus meets him along the way. But he was given authority by the high priest and stuff to go down and to bring all the Christians that were there into bondage and to bring them into judgment. That's what Paul was going to do. And the reason why he could not fulfill that at that time was because God knew that the prophecy of Damascus becoming a ruinous heap would, in, the, in the fortress of Ephraim would not cease in the days of Paul. Had Paul gone all the way down and had Paul been successful and never been converted from Saul to Paul, then that scripture would have been prematurely fulfilled because he would have made sure that he brought the Christians in. And yet the scripture in Isaiah clearly prophesied that Ephraim would have a fortress. And that fortress would be Damascus. It would be the Syrian government would protect the Christian population there for many, many, many years to come. And that is one thing that the Syrian government has always done. They have protected the Christian population living in Damascus. That was the case until Isis came in. And Isis, as we know, was a U.S. Israeli backed jihadist group bent on wiping out the Christian populations in all parts of the world. Now they say they killed Muslims too. Sure they did. But as one man brought out recently, he said, isn't it funny? They never target Jewish people. ISIS only targets Muslims and Christians. Hmm, that ought to be interesting. And how would they be able to do that? Well, it's easy to do if you have forgotten the God of your salvation 
and you have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. So Israel forgets the God of her salvation. And of course, the Christians, they're not mindful of Jesus Christ any longer. Which, <clears throat> starting to lose my voice, guys. That kind of came on suddenly tonight. Um, so let me back it up real quick here to this one here again. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm. So I have a feeling there's a lot more to what we have here written in Daniel than what meets the eye. So I'm going to really spend more time uh, this week in really breaking down and translating all of this uh, written in Daniel because I think we're missing a lot of information, uh, especially because we're looking at Egypt. And by the way, Egypt is, is to fall. Uh, there, what well, even I think that's down here in Daniel 11 as well, near the end. I think it says, and Egypt shall be at his steps. Let's see, yeah, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Um, and it's just inter and also, uh, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, Ammon, by the way, is modern day Jordan. Isn't it interesting? If you look at the ones, they'll be delivered out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Ammon is, now the Jews have swore they're going to kill Edom, or Edom, but uh, Edom in this case here is also the, so, Edom could even be part of Saudi Arabia. I mean, technically, if you look at a map, it's more southern Jordan. Um, let me pull up a map here real quick here. We'll take a quick peek at that. I know that several countries come down and they're all together at that spot. Oh, by the way, I got a message. I forget who sent this to me. I think it was my friend in FEMA. There, I think how Turner reported reported this. Uh, they believe it's a meteorite impact up in the Antarctica. Let me go back to it. I have my FEMA contact. It was an anomaly near Antarctica reported 80 foot waves moving north. And uh, they believe it's actually a meteorite impact that caused it. Do you realize how big an 80 foot wave is? I, I could only imagine 80 foot wave. That's a big meteorite, um, if that's the case. All right, anyway, so, yeah, so you have Jordan. Yeah, so if you go, yeah, Edom was in this area right here in southern Jordan, northwest uh, Saudi Arabia. So, and then also, too, there's a lot of been a lot of talk about, uh, and this was through intel sources, that Egypt would be brought down. Uh, and so I find that interesting when we look at that, because you have Moab, you have Edom, and we had um, children of Ammon. Ammon, of course, are the, are the Jordanians. Uh, so very, very interesting as we look at all this here. Uh, I'm going to pause for now. Like I said, I've got, I'm still, uh, where I end up losing my voice, I've got to go, I'm going on over with Jason for a little bit here in just a little bit, but if you guys have any questions, let's, let's, we can discuss things that you guys would like if you want to ask. So, so ask away. Hmm. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, Steve. Does this have anything to do with the assassination attempt with Assad? I, as far as with Damascus be, and Syria and everything and power. Yeah, I think there's a good possibility because Israel is really bent on not stopping. I think even the part about Israel pulling their troops out of uh, southern. 
Gaza, which, by the way, they didn't pull out of everything. They didn't stop bombing Gaza either. Um, in fact, it's still like a free-for-all over there. But uh, but I have a feeling that um, they're only preparing for the next fronts. And they're really wanting to get this war on with Iran. I don't, the thing what I don't know, well, let me say this. I know a lot of people are out there hoping Trump will get back into office and change things. If Trump gets back into office, I think it's going to make things worse. Because Trump's going to definitely side with Israel, and then there's not going to be any questions asked. They're just going to go out there and obliterate everybody in the Middle East. So, but now, is that what makes prophecy come to pass? It may, but it's not It's not the pretty way of things happening. Um you know, but 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 what's sad is so many people really think that this is a good thing. You know, and I don't see a single politician in this race, any of them good. Biden's not good. Trump's not good. And even as much as I would have liked to have said Kennedy might would have been a good candidate, he's, I mean, every one of them are owned by Chabad. And when Chabad owns all the candidates, and what's weird, they're, they're owned across the entire globe. Netanyahu is a Chabad Jewish guy. Uh, Zelensky, Chabad. Putin, Chabad. Trump, Chabad. His son-in-law, Chabad. His daughter, Chabad. You know, uh, Biden, he, he sucks up to Chabad. If you look at Kennedy, his father met on more than one occasion with Menachem Schneerson, the head rebbe of the Chabad Lubavitch movement. They're everyone owned by him. In fact, Kennedy had a, did a photo op with a very prominent rabbi right there with Chabad Lebovich uh, uh, Schneerson, a big photo plastered in behind him. And then I said, yeah, just like I did that one video not long ago, I had uh, Zelensky and Putin up there, both of them with their Chabad, Chabadnik rabbis that run them. And, and yet they're at war with each other. And Chabad is the biggest political arm in the world. This is the reason why all the politicians in America haven't got the courage to stand up and say something's wrong over in Israel. You know, had Hamas truly been the one that orchestrated October the 7th and, and Israel really got hit the way they did, I would actually have a little bit more understanding of what's happening in, in Gaza right now. Not that I would agree with the genocide of all these innocent people, but I would actually have a little bit more understanding. But when they do it in such a way to where even a kindergartner can figure out it's a setup, you know, you got to really begin to wonder. I mean, this is a government that was so bent on allowing their own people to be massacred just to justify their global wars that they're about to do. So, any, any other questions? So what we will do, I've got to go figure out what's going on with my throat is because, it, like I said, this suddenly kind of hit me. I don't know why. But, uh, all right. We will be back again next week. And uh, I'm still going to go back over this. So I'm going to spend this week then really translating uh, all these different uh, parts here on um, here on Daniel. And I'm going to see if there's a pattern because I have, that's one thing I've wondered for a long time. I mean, normally I, I've done a lot of study of the scholars and what scholars say, and I see the different points that they make about how this was fulfilled at certain certain time, this is certain certain time, stuff like that. And so that's one reason why I've never really gone into this deeply other than down there when I got to verse you know, 38, 39, and 40. <clears throat> and even the part about verse 44, <clears throat> tidings out of the east and the north are frightening him. And that's actually the king of the south that he gets nervous about. And he shall go forth with a great fury to destroy not only to take away many, and, and I really feel like <clears throat> that is something that is really happening right now. Uh, because Netanyahu is really with such fury and veracity of 
killing as many people as he possibly can. And and and, and is it because he's a you know he personally is afraid of um, you know Russia or China stepping in for some reason? Uh, and you know how is that going to play out? I don't know. I don't know. But you know, recently I was looking at one of these other documents, and Jesus talks about uh, a lot. He literally, I forget. I think it's one of the maybe it's one of the Nakamati writings or something. I don't know now. But but uh, he mentions that he's telling his apostles that many of the things uh, would be fulfilled at a much later time than what, because they were all looking for these things to be fulfilled now, you know, or in their lifetime. And he actually mentioned in this one that I was reading, he said, this will be in a generation far removed from the generation in which you are in. <clears throat> so, and he actually says on there, and this is what kind of made me start going back to these writings as well, if you kind of wonder why I'm doing this, because he said that every sacred word that the prophets had written about, he said, will be fulfilled. And, but he put that all in a future context far removed from their own time frame. So now, rather than looking at, say, things like Daniel or Isaiah, I mean, not to say there's not things that they didn't speak about that got fulfilled years ago, I now have more of a justification to look at these prophecies and say, okay, wait a minute. If Jesus said it's going to be an age far uh, removed from the age that the apostles were in and that every sacred word of the prophets would come to pass, then we really got to begin to examine some of these prophecies in light of that and really try to understand which ones have not yet been fulfilled, which ones are waiting there that we're about to see unfold. And is it something that could benefit us uh, in knowing those, those prophecies? You know, even this thing about Jonah, right? The Jonah that is supposed to be the sign of his return, you know, but he actually goes into writing on that that's even deeper than what we see. And he told his disciples not to tell anyone. So Im imagine seeing him talk like that and then tell them that they can't say anything about it. You know, uh, that's pretty, it gets, it gets pretty intense, so... All right, guys. Well, you guys have a wonderful and blessed evening. And uh, we will be together again Tuesday night. And and uh, we're going to, and I'm going to, I'll also look for more prophecies besides Daniel. I'll work on tr translating the rest of Daniel. And then uh, I'll be looking for others. And if you want to send me some, something like that, uh, that would be wonderful. So, Mallory, you are so welcome. God bless you. God bless all of you here. Hey, Deb. Steve. Yes, ma'am. You said Tuesday night. Did you mean Thursday? Thursday, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, Thursday. So, you, you know, that's what happens when you got rented lips. I borrowed these lips from somebody. I don't know who I got them from. I'll have to return them though now. So, <laughs> all right. God bless you guys. Y'all have a great night. And, oh, Elizabeth, don't forget to stop your recording. I don't want to mess you up.